Welcome to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Education. I'm Pete Wright. Right over there is Howard Tybal. Hello, Howard. Hello, Pete. <laughs> What's a good word, man? Uh, we're feeling good. We're back from our summer hiatus, uh, and uh, I think you could say the biggest event of our break was your work uh, at a fantastic higher ed conference, the Nakubo 2018 annual meeting. And uh, you and I have talked extensively about your experience at that session, not just your work, but your experience with the folks that you saw speaking. And there are three of them that that really stood out to you. When you talk about transformative higher education uh, conferences, those things might, to to many people, sound like uh, an oxymoron. Yeah, yeah. Right. The team at Nakubo put together a fantastic slate of people this year, people who who came to test uh, opinions, to test uh, positions and to push you in some new ways. Yeah. You know, and I give a lot of credit, as you said, to the team and as well as to John Walda, who this was his last Nakubo annual meeting as CEO. Well, let's talk about uh, about Kamau Bell uh, first. He's a comedian. Uh, he is uh, known to talk uh, extensively about race. He's no stranger to controversy in his speaking and speaking truth to cultural power. You know, we're, we're fond of speaking truth to power around these parts. Yep. Uh, and, and his message was clear, as you told told me if he does his job right he's going to provoke you but not offend i think he acknowledged that for some people in the room he's going to offend i mean he he acknowledged that and he's right the majority of people in that room were white uh, interestingly he as he was really making everybody laugh and, and using humor around a tough topic he opened the idea of what it is to be in an uncomfortable conversation and ultimately i'd say his overarching message that i took away to again predominantly white audience is what does it mean for us to speak up as a group around uh, denouncing racial injustice and calling us out to say, you got a role to play in this. And what does it mean to step up and not be the silent majority? Even though you may agree with these principles, we need more from you. And in that way, it was a powerful conversation through lots of anecdotes and stories he told and a tremendous amount of humor. I want to put my uh, higher ed uh, leadership shoes on, you, you know, because it's easy to get mired in a conversation like that around the global discussion of race and class and injustice. And there is a rich discussion to be had there. But if I am a uh, college president or I'm, I'm a finance leader, what is it that I'm to take away from that kind of presentation? What is it that I'm going to do eight o'clock day one when I get back to campus? Campus. Many of the people in the room were people that work and report to the presidents. I would say in this particular case, presidents and chancellors, many of them were not in the room. So the opportunity for the business officers is to go back and introduce this idea of more generically being willing to provoke and and be on the edge of not offending. And I think this is a story that we need to really start grasping even more is how do we ensure that we're having a conversation and not so worried about whether we're upsetting people around us. And I had this conversation at Cornell yesterday, and I said, we have to stop being so concerned about having people's feelings being hurt. We have to be willing to not try to please everybody and have the tough conversations. And he was brilliant at bringing that idea. So let's talk about just the idea of race. Racial inequality is one example on a college campus that leaders need to grapple with, whether it's race, sexuality, access, affordability. You take any of these topics – Leaders have to be willing to describe the brutal facts about this to engage their constituents. So what I would say for education leaders is be willing to raise tough issues and you do not have to be at the top of the food chain to think about yourself as a leader. You could be a director or you could be a staff person, but being willing to raise tough issues – is something that we all need to take responsibility for. And I would ask everybody 
listening to this to say, what can I be doing or saying on my campus that people are not talking about that should be talked about? Because here's the truth, Pete. Most people, when you speak up, there is a subgroup that's saying, thank God that person said that. I didn't have the courage to say it, but thank God it got spoken. That's it to me. And that's how this has been sort of resonating with me that since we've started talking about it, that the communities we build and the people who live underneath the processes and procedures and systems that we put in place, those are our responsibility. And if we're not aware, if we don't have that more than back of mind awareness, that front of mind awareness at how our policies, procedures, systems, bylaws actually impact people of different races, cultures, classes, you know, uh, that is an important thing for us to bring to the front. So part of this awareness, Pete, is that is recognizing that I bring prejudice, even though I have this external sense, superficial sense that I'm not prejudiced. Kamal Bell raised the bar for us to be able to actually be in a conversation where all of us can recognize we're in this together and can we let down our guard a little bit and admit that we bring these implicit biases to looking at each other, whether it's race, whether it's class, whether it's sexual orientation, and start to open a conversation. Uh, the other thing I'll say, and I was talking with my wife about this, and, and, and in conversations with her, because she's been doing lots of social justice work over the years, it hit me that I'm going to make a mistake in this conversation. How so? I'm going to make mistakes in this, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's hard to talk about we're afraid of saying the wrong thing. If I can admit and others commit, you know what? I don't have this figured out. I'm going to make – I'm going to say the wrong thing. I might offend somebody. I'm not intending to. Can you give me goodwill that – I'm actually coming from the right place, even though I might not be educated on something. If we can bring that way of being to each other, I think we can transform how we work together. And that is a great lesson for campus communities, because campus communities, we have we have seen experiences, right? We have experiences of campus communities being, uh, you know, sort of a, a spark of reactivity. But as leaders to be able to go back and say we have we need to come at this from two directions first we need to do our best to keep all of these issues at the very front of mind to be aware of our own prejudice prejudices and also we have to be forgiving to those who come from a place of goodwill as we try to work together to do the right thing if we don't do this and we're holding the you know the keys to these institutions what are we teaching our students about their capacity to be able to be in tough conversations. We need to find a way to have people be willing to be in a conversation so they can learn, and I'm speaking about myself now, so I can learn, learn where I do have biases. So, so the other person can see where I do have a contribution to make, and, and we can bring that level of respect to each other. One of the things you reflected with me on is this idea of the silent majority. Is, is being silent but doing the right thing good enough? The answer is no. <laughs> and I, I think when we look at the majority in many different examples – uh, trying to change, even on the, in the most basic kind of policies we want to change in our institutions, there is a silent majority that will not be disloyal to the vocal minority. Often the vocal minority will speak for the silent majority. You will actually use that language. I'm speaking for my peers. Yeah. The truth is, is that knowing that we have a silent majority within that group, you got to be willing to stand up and if you believe something, take a risk. Take a risk in a meeting to say, I have to say something right now. I think we're going down the wrong path. Or I have to say, I don't, I don't think we've clarified why we're doing this. And I don't know about others, but until I understand that, I don't think we should be moving forward. Most people will not do this unless they're in a position of authority. What I would encourage people to say is be willing to speak those things because people around that will appreciate you and – that is actually the best way to move yourself through your organization and grow is by taking a risk and speaking up and discovering that you have something to contribute that way. Can we move on and talk a little bit about Matthew Lunn? Matthew told a story about the importance of character being the center 
of transformation. That's fascinating. What is that? What does he mean by that? Now, this is a guy who comes from from Pixar. He's on the Brain Trust at Pixar. He has been involved in some of the biggest Pixar franchises that that they have produced. And here he is talking to higher ed leadership about the importance of communicating character. You are the movie guy, right? I've been known to see some movies. Yeah, you Ed, you got a podcast on yeah, movies. I do. Which we should. We're going to do a podcast on you someday. <laughs> okay. So. But the movie Up, he talked yeah. about Up and his involvement in Up and the emotional roller coaster that it produces in the listeners. I can't watch the first five minutes without tearing up, right? It, it tells the whole story of uh, this old man and uh, his, you know, courting this young woman and they fall in love and they build a home and they have these plans for a baby and it's, it's all so happy. And then the wife learns she can't have a child and their plans start to fall through. But then they, they have another, uh, you know, this other swing where they discover they could move to South America and everybody's thrilled and then they can't save enough money and then he sells his old pocket watch and he buys it in this roller coaster he buys the tickets to South America and everything's fantastic and oh my god man then he gets home and she passes away and this is all before the movie even gets started and and the funny thing is Matthew said and this is a kids movie right (laughs) right in that story of the emotional roller coaster as you take people through that kind of emotional transformation you're actually able to connect with their own connection to themselves his provocation in the community college conversation was when you tell stories weave it through a character because you will connect with your audience so if you're trying to do your next vision for your institution talk about it from the point of view of a student and a student walking the path of that world and the ups and downs they're going to experience and ultimately the transformation that will get produced for that student. And if you can paint that story through a character versus our strategic plan, which is just so amorphous, you're going to be able to connect people to themselves and then they're going to want to be engaged and involved. So I have always been aware of the power of what's your key message. I had never been so clearly aware of the importance of using character to tell a story in a business context. And I think it's a brilliant way of going forward. It is brilliant. I I absolutely love it. And this was completely non sort of immediately intuitive to me too, that uh, we often have, you know, pictures. I mean, the number of photo shoots I've done for colleges that where, you know, we're taking pictures, these splashy pictures of, of happy students. That is one time. That's one event. That's one snapshot in time that we get with those students. But real emotional connection comes from a transformation over time. And I love the idea right. of painting the picture of our institutions, of the people who attend and work for our institutions, uh, to our various publics in the context of their transformation over time. That's what a movie is. That's why we love movies. The great characters really change over two hours. That's what we get to see in the way we communicate our mission. I think that's great. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Ex- ex- yeah. So that was Matthew, and he did his wonderful thing, and I had the privilege of, of being with him in a brief conversation, 45-minute tw- conversation with community colleges. And then the final keynote was Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda. Which, which I probably should have known or taken the time, but I, I I hadn't done that. And I found myself in the back of the room, you know, and all of a sudden I looked up and, I, and she's talking about when I was, she goes, when I was 59 years old, and I'm thinking, holy cow, what's she going to say now? <laughs> that hits close to home. And yeah, really close. And she said, I turned 60. It's like, what's the rest of my life going to be? She had done some research for this book that she had written around the third act. And she discovered that Our generation or the generation today is living on average 34 years longer than our grandparents' generation. That's not long ago. So it's a whole lifetime, 34 additional years. What are you going to do with that? Between, I think, our greater capacity to stay healthier as we get older, we're finding ourselves in our 60s, 70s, and 80s. There are people who are discovering that this is not the – the downturn, right? The bell curve where it's only down from here, but it's an opportunity to think about staying engaged. And her whole story tied to not only that kind of positivity, but she reflected on the challenges in her life and her multiple marriages and and looked back and said, you know, 
there were ways I looked at the world that were negative, and she tied in research around neuroplasticity and how we can change our brains by putting a different kind of energy and bringing positivity and actually being able to move away from the negativity that opens up a whole other window of thinking about your third act. Like, what is it you want to be doing? I t- I've been talking with leaders about uh, about uh, chapters. I love this idea of a third act in that I think most people think about 60 and older mm-hmm. as the time where it's going to be more looking back than looking forward. And my hope for others, including myself and you know my wife and people that I love – is that, that we look at our going forward from 60 and older and say, what else do we want to do in the world? What does it mean to stay engaged and continue to make a contribution? I think more of our world is showing up where we have those opportunities to step into that space. I want to go back to this perspective of higher ed leadership in the audience, right? Because Fonda's message sounds to me as something that's deeply personal, right? That she's trying to attack attached to you at an emotional uh, emotional level, which clearly she did, uh, about what are you going to do with this third act of your life? Is there a third act for institutions? Is there a message for us uh, at an institutional leadership view? You look around the room at the number of gray-haired folk who are still actively involved. They are sitting there going, what's next? And I think her story opens the question for people who are in their 60s who have an idea about what's next, whether it's retirement in the traditional sense. I think she's opening a different conversation and inspiring people to say, you know, maybe I have another act in me that I can go off and take everything I've learned in 65 years and now I can give back. And I can give back through my, through consulting or I can give back uh, to higher education through volunteering. But it's not over. And a lot. if I looked around the room, I think many people – I would probably speculate maybe a third of the people of the thousand people in the room are sitting in that question, what do I do looking forward if I step out of work? I know people right now, the reason they're still in their jobs – is because they don't have a plan. And they drastically underestimate their own ability to change. That's right. That's right. That's what she's provoking in a positive way. Can you look at your life not as an arc going down, but possibly stairs going up, right? And then into your 70s and into your 80s even. And when she was talking about looking at her 90s and and approaching her her life as what's next – And she just turned 80 years old. So I was so inspired to think about turning 60 next year and thinking, all right, I'm not crazy to think that I've got more to give and that I got more looking forward that I can that I can produce in the world than spending my time being nostalgic about what life was like and when I didn't have these physical pains. Yeah, which is what old people do, right? Yeah. I'm starting to yeah. Me and my friends, we sit around, we talk about pains. Pains, <laughs> things are really. breaking, eyes are getting worse exactly. every day. Yeah. Uh, I can't even see you right now. <laughs> like, I, think, I think that's you, Pete. I know the voice. It sounds like this was a a, a fantastic uh, tapestry. You'd never know it was Nakuba. You'd, I mean, that's uh, yeah. the problem, right? It, it is amazing and, frankly, bold. It is a bold set of choices that they made uh, this year, and I think they have a lot to be proud of over there. So, And I think that what's, what's great about it is, you know, what's the next act, right, for right. them forward? How do they continue to build on this broader uh, view of – what it means to give back to their members, what kind of learning do their members need. And I think they really tapped into this idea that it's not finance skills. Yeah. You know, those are the basics. Right. Right. That's that's what got us here. But, you know, anytime you have a leadership change, what a great segue to another future conversation for you and I. Uh, Every time you have a major leadership change at the top, you have your own opportunity for a third act kind of reflection. Right. This is this is that chance. What are we going to be tomorrow? 
I love it, Howard. Thank you so much for bringing this to the podcast. I'm so glad to be able to participate in this conversation with you. I hope it helps others out there. Yeah, we have a great little brief write-up that's uh, on the site that people can read that summarizes what we just talked about. Absolutely. Uh, And thank you, everybody, as always, for downloading and listening to this show. You can head over to tybalink.com to learn more about our work in education and subscribe to the show for free. Just click the blue button and we'll send you an email each time a new episode is released. If you like what you heard here today, please share with a friend or colleague who you think might appreciate a new podcast in their own library. On behalf of Howard Teibel, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next time right here on Navigating Change, the podcast from Teibel Education. Thank you.